shall we just stay out or? Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, in a few seconds, we close the screen now. So, okay. so pointer. Ah, uh, this one. Okay. All right. Um, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is work about bacteria, and I don't do experiments. So the experiments that I will be talking about, and some modeling, of course, have been done by this gentleman. It actually will be about three sets of experiments uh, about Japanese and Chinese bacteria uh, from a group of Masaki Sano in Tokyo. Uh, this gentleman here is not doing experiments, but working with me on the modeling side. The group of Yiling Wu in the Chinese University of Hong Kong, if you can read this, and the group of He Peng Chang in Shanghai. And um, so before actually proceeding to my talk, I would like to let you know that um, I'm the lead editor of Physical Review Letters, and that's a journal that is doing physics, of course, but includes also lots of uh, work that uh, many authors are sitting in the audience, in fact. And I would like to remind you that this uh, journal publishes relevant uh, works in the kind of thing we've been discussing here from, this is actually this week, robots, very simple robots, robots here doing collectively some interesting stuff. Uh, swarms, uh, animals, this one here is actually about to appear, and so on. I'm not sure you can read the titles at least. Um, fish schools, of course, flocks, termite nests, uh, foraging problems, and humans, and some others here. Okay, just to let you know that all these, many of these papers have been actually highlighted in what, uh, in physics, which is this electronic only highlighting journal. And this one, this one, if I go back, this one, this one, this one, and so on. These get a lot of press, thanks to uh, the work of the editors here. So anyway, if you want to talk about the journal and you ever wanted why should not, should I publish there or not, you can talk to me, whoops. Okay. <laughs> I hope it's not the end of a talk. It's back? Okay. All right. So, uh, okay. So why study collective motion of bacteria? Uh, as you probably know, bacteria do all kinds of things collectively. Uh, you know, some bacteria crawl on surfaces, some others swim in fluids, some of it twitch, so-called twitching motility. They move together, they build together things. Uh, and so this has been studied, of course, in microbiology for the sake of biology. But here my viewpoint would be more, okay, can these systems be good systems for doing new, or for discovering or studying new interesting physics? So basically here, this is not you know, physics for biology, to help biologists. Now, at least that's not the main purpose, or the first purpose, but it's rather uh, can biology do something interesting for physics. And of course, in the end, we hope we can close the loop and whatever we say as a physicist has some interest for the biologist, okay. So, and basically the talk will be revolving about this basic question whether can we stupidly consider bacteria swimming, for example, or bacteria crawling as little particles interacting with physical interactions only. So on, on long time scales and evolutionary time scales, this is the answer is certainly no, but on short time scales re regarding the motion uh, of these things together, uh, I will show you that in some cases at least, it's, we have pretty good descriptions, even quantitative descriptions, by using strictly physical uh, interactions between, between little particles indeed. Okay, so this is within the general framework of what is now called active matter physics. And before I really go to the bacteria, I, would, I have to give you some background information about uh, where we stand in active matter physics and uh, using some results that would be useful to understand the bacteria results later. So if you, really come, if you re really came for the bacteria, you should bear with me for a few minutes and then you'll see the bacteria. Okay. Uh, we've so the bigger picture here is about uh, statistical physics, which basically is about uh, understanding uh, emergence or collective properties, 
given microscopic or local rules, can, how can I predict and not just observe the collective behavior. And we've heard about universality a few days ago. Uh, in statistical physics, we believe in universality. We believe in it, in, it has various meanings. The meaning that Andrea put forward a couple of days ago, Andrea Cavagna, is, uh, is well established mathematically. But there is another level, wider, more qualitative level of universality. Um, and my favorite example for this is a very classical example, but still one of the best in my view, in my opinion at least. Okay. Um, as you may know, most simple fluids are described by the Navier-Stokes equations. So this is a set of partial differential equations, which is a very interesting mathematical object, but it is well known, well recognized, and well understood why these equations are describing all kinds of fluids made, made of whatever molecules, and even sometimes not even molecules, little particles moving on some lattice respecting the right symmetries and conservation laws will be described at large scales by the Navier-Stokes equation, and the only difference between this or that fluid would be in the coefficients of the terms of that equation. So that level of universality or genericity, or robustness of description, is, is, is what I have in mind here when I speak of universality. The universality in the sense of critical phenomena is also important, but you have to have a critical system. So here, if you, if you assume that there must be or there could be some degree of universality, at least at this general qualitative level that I described here, uh, studying simple models out of the many, many, many possible models giving the same collective behavior up to prefactors. Studying the simplest ones is certainly a reasonable idea. So that's the viewpoint we have here. And so once this is said, you will see, I will show you very simple models. Um, and to situate, to locate active matter physics, uh, here is a list of different ways of being out of equilibrium. So energy is injected in the system at some, in some way. You can be near equilibrium and use this proximity to have perturbative approaches. You can go very, very, very slowly to equilibrium, and that's the glass problem, glassy transitions and so on. You can be maintained out of equilibrium by some external field, you know, migration field or concentration field or a flux of something, temperature gradient. Or you can be, uh, I would say, genuinely out of equilibrium in the bulk at the level of the units in your systems, which are coupled together. These units spend energy to do some things. And active matter uh, falls into this class, of course, this, is, this uh, general framework. And more precisely, active matter is where the units actually spending energy collected from the environment or stored internally to uh, move themselves or to move other things. Uh, and the general problem of, of the collective properties of these uh, active particles or self-propelled particles uh, is often in terms of collective motion. That's one of the main themes, so not strictly, not only, okay? So lots of examples, of course, relevant to this audience, uh, animal groups, cells, uh, bacteria, but also uh, subcellular components like molecular motors and biofilaments, and also artificial swimmers of some sorts, uh, and various colloidal particles, okay. Now, uh, so on all scales, and, and, and the questions we have is whether can, we can have, at least in some cases, make predictions on some understanding, reach some understanding, uh, which are basically uh, across all scales. Uh, another distinction which will come in the discussion, I, I'm putting all this here because it will be interesting later in the, with the bacteria experiments. Uh, in, in active matter, we often distinguish wet and dry active matter. So dry active matter is when you can neglect or you want to neglect uh, the fluid in which the particles, surrounding the particles. So if I, if I walk here, okay, I displace the air around me of a wildebeest moving, you know. Indeed, the air displacement between the wildebeest is not gonna be very important. Uh, for fish or birds, you can think uh, about it. It's not so obvious. Uh, and uh, for some swimming bacteria, without confinement, clearly you cannot neglect the fluid. 
if the bacteria are very confined near surfaces, you will see in a moment that you can ask yourself whether this is a wet or dry system. Okay. And of course, neglecting the fluid makes things much, much simpler, and our current understanding of dry active matter is actually uh, far you know, more advanced than of wet systems of swimmers. Okay. Now, only for now, again, uh, for just act dry active matter, uh, there's been lots of work in the general framework of as simple as possible models. Okay. And typically, this simple setting is you have a constant self-proportion force, a little constant speed for particles when they are at least uh, alone. It's a uh, is our physics word for saying that this uh, dynamic is overdamped and first order in time, no inertia, although we, we have some words about inertia here before. The interactions are strictly local for simplicity. And the noise often is a stochastic component in all these uh, persistent random walkers acting on their direction of motion, rotational noise, okay? Now, of course, it's important, or it's interesting only when you have interactions, and these interactions can be of various types, and you can have just alignment between particles. And if you have point particles, you know, like in the Vickshack model, uh, this is really the only thing you have. You have alignment competing with noise, uh, given the self-proportion of the particles. You can have just repulsion between particles, and we've heard some of this, uh, something about this yesterday, about MIPS. MIPS is a motility-induced phase separation where uh, particles only interact by repulsion, which means in, that when they are entering a dense area, their speed will decrease or they will just stop. And so they can actually phase separate into large microscopic dense clusters without any explicit attractive force between them, so that is okay. And now if you think of anything realistic, like elongated objects moving together and colliding into each other, then you have a mix of repulsion, and repulsion can induce alignment, and this is typically a simple models of bacteria have been in terms of these elongated rods, self-propelled colliding, and so on, okay. You see here there's phase separation in MIPS. There's also phase separation, in fact, in the Vickshack world in those point particles only interacting by alignment, where alignment is clearly the dominating interaction in other terms. And here I have one example of a Vickshack style model. So this is a Vickshack model, point particles, constant speed, some noise. And the alignment here is what we call pneumatic alignment. Uh, so that's a formula for coding it, but uh, in a nutshell, basically when two particles come at uh, some acute angle, they will align and continue together. And if they come at some obtuse angle, right, larger than pi over two, they, were, they will anti-align and go away from each other, but in opposite directions, okay? So that's an emetic alignment for, for words, with words. And in all these Vickshack systems, when you have, for example, Large noise, basically the noise dominates the alignment and your system is disordered, mm, some very short correlation lengths and times. And you, if your noise is actually low enough and not necessarily zero, you can have a globally ordered phase. And here maybe you see that half of the little arrows are going up and half of the little arrows are going down. That's a global pneumatic order that has arisen uh, spontaneously from these uh, local interactions, okay? In between, all these Vickshack systems, uh, in fact, undergo uh, something which is like a phase separation uh, scenario. Um, there, there is a region of parameters in, in noise here or in density where uh, the ordered liquid, here will the ordered phase here, coexists with the gas. You see here, you don't see it, but you have to believe me, this is a very dense, band along which the particles are traveling 50% uh, to the right, 50% to the left, which has spontaneously emerged, and outside it, you are left with a sparse gas. So bits of, you have a gas here, and you have the ordered phase, ordered liquid here, and you can see that tuning this parameter, you can go for a very low uh, dense, fraction of dense pneumatic order regions, to uh, dominating dom pneumatic order. So that is a phase separation that is at stake here. Uh, what is also known in Vickshack 
star models and all kinds of active matter systems is that in the ordered phase here, you have interesting fluctuations and correlations, which set up generically, typically, particles will superdiffuse in the transverse dimension to the order, okay? So you don't need to input any levy walk distribution, et cetera. From these local interactions, collectively, the particles set up a, an ordered regime in which they move superdiffusively. Another signature or correlated signature to this is the fact that f f number fluctuations in these ordered phase are anomalously strong. You know, you, you might want to believe that if I look at this uh, system here and I measure the number of particles in subboxes of increasing size, okay, basically I'm gonna have a law of large numbers and the fluctuations of the number of particles in a given box will be like square root of a mean. The root mean square of these fluctuations will go like square root of a mean number of particles. That's the law of large numbers. In fact, that's not true, and we understand why it's not true. Uh, and typically what happens is that you do have uh, the, here the variance, or the root mean square, I never remember, going uh, like some power law, this is log log scales, of a mean, mean number of particles, and variance of this number goes like a power law, but this power law is not one, or not one half a root mean square, it's something larger. So the, for the root mean square here, we typically observe something but of the order of 0 0.8 instead of 0 0.5, which would be the law of large numbers. This is very generic feature, a uh, semi-quantitative feature of all these systems um, whenever you have alignment competing with noise. Another interesting signature of this case, of the so-called Vickshack style rods, I call these rods because uh, they mimic the, the, the fact that two elongating objects getting into collision might, and might have this pneumatic alignment, okay. Here we have measured in the same ordered, pneumatically ordered fluctuating phase, uh, the intensity of a, the quality of a pneumatic order as a function of system size or subsystem size. And you see here again in, in log log scales, that uh, this uh, pneumatic order parameter decreases, but it decreases slower than a power law. This is, uh, if it would be a power law, it would be a straight line. It goes like a power law to some asymptotic finite value. These numerical results, if I extrapolate them boldly, uh, lead me to say that in this system, you may have true long range pneumatic order, which is for physicists in the room, still a surprise, a matter of debate, okay? All right all kinds of interesting physics there. Now, can we see this anywhere? Um, okay, so uh, beyond little particles and Vickshack simulations, we do have lots of theoretical work behind this. And of course, this is not the audience and I don't have the time to go into any of this. Um, so that's just to say that we do better than just simulating Vickshack models. Um, okay, me and many other people. But there is a relative scarcity of experiments showing uh, the same sort of behavior as these very simple models. This is not too surprising because anything you can think of is gonna be more complicated than these simple things. Uh, so that's not a, you know, it's, on, it's important to understand the simplest possible situation. It's not a big deal if any realistic situation is more complicated because it's still important to understand the core. But we you do find some simulations, some, simulation, some experiments, some realistic situations in which uh, what we observe is actually very, very close to these uh, silly vickshack like things, okay? Uh, so I show you uh, bacteria now, and this can be also done on other systems where you have both very large number of moving objects uh, and a reasonably good control on, on, on them. You know, here for biofilaments and motor proteins, if you purify properly your proteins, then you know exactly what's in your soup. Uh, for active colloidal particles, you typically they are complicated, but it's just physics. Bacteria is more mis mysterious and more of a challenge, but they are offering uh, some control, All right? So the rest of, to of the talk is about three sets of experiments. These are three of these, all right? One, it will be equalized cell. Uh, strongly confined between two glass plates, that's what you see here, and you see already, maybe you see it here, that there is some pneumatic order, at least on this scale. Uh, number two would be uh, quasi-2D uh, 
wet active pneumatic systems, and I, I will tell you what it is, of swimming bacteria. You see this, this is the dynamics that have been shown by Andre uh, at the end of his talk and is typical of wet active pneumatics. And this is the most mysterious weak synchronization of very, very dense E. coli suspension again, okay? So first, first, hello, yes. So I'm not sure if you see this on the screen. Here, this is the same. This is the, these E. coli cells are elongated by, they've been drugged, so they are longer than usual. They're typically 20 microns in this, uh, in this movie. And they are confined between two glass spaces. They can hardly pass across each other, but they do. But just, just, just. And I'm not sure if you see it on the screen, but here there is very large scale pneumatic order in the diagonal direction. From where I, well, from where I stand, I, can't see, I cannot see it, so, but anyway. Uh, in spite of, obviously, the, part, the particles, the, the bacteria are swimming, they are not strictly aligned in this pneumatic direction, but nevertheless, statistically, they are moving 50% up there and 50% down here, okay? Here it's a millimeter square field of view with very, very many bacteria. All of them are marked by fluorescence, so you can see them rather easily. When they meet each other, they often collide, okay? And if they collide with some small but finite probability, they actually end up being more aligned, pneumatically aligned, than they were initially. And that we have done this on, on, on individual, you know, binary collisions statistics. Okay, so this global pneumatic order, in fact, you can study the way I've showed you for the, the Vicek rods, uh, very, very silly model, dry model. So these are swimmers here that are so highly confined that uh, you can wonder. And you can see here, for example, here, uh, in blue, it's a, a sparse system and not enough bacteria to have emerging long range order. And the number of fluctuations, uh, these are normal fluctuations. Here, this is the root mean square divided, uh, the, yeah, the root mean square divided by square root of the uh, mean, okay? So normal fluctuations, law of large numbers for non-interacting or weakly interacting bacteria would be flat, and it's what you have when you have not enough bacteria to have uh, this large-scale global pneumatic order emerging, but when you do have a large-scale pneumatic order, you see that this thing departs from the flat here and goes up with an exponent uh, smaller than the 0 0.8 of the Vichyck model, but Okay, this, this is experimental data, it could be. All right. Uh, and here is a signature of, again, if it's disordered, the pneumatic order goes down as a function of subsystem size here, like it should be in a disordered system with finite correlation lengths. Uh, but in the ordered situation, you cannot see it here, but it's, it's basically constant. It actually decreases uh, slower than a power law. This is, again, log log scales. It going like a power law to a finite asymptotic value, just like in the Vickshack model. So this behaves at this semi-quantitative level, very much like this very dry, silly model. And it's kind of a mystery why the hydrodynamic interactions are completely screened by the two surfaces in below, between which the bacteria are confined. Okay, so that's a system that, as far as I can tell, behaves very much to my, like the Vickshack system, or any system of a class of, of this rods, system, uh, vickshack like rods, but uh, it is a, nominally about swimmers. So it makes you think about wet and dry, you know, the effect of confinement on systems. All right. I, I quickly go to the other experiment. So here, this is, again, elongated cells. And so here we don't, we produce pneumatic order locally. You see that locally the cells are forming this pneumatic order without putting them in some pneumatic liquid crystal is just because, again, here these cells are slightly longer than their white type uh, state. They have been drugged, again, like the E. coli before, to grow typically to larger size. And when they are long enough, they align uh, strongly enough to produce local pneumatic order. And what you see here, what you saw here, is the motion, spontaneous motion of these cells. So these cells is just observing this is about 300 microns, over one or two millimeters of a growing colony of these cells in standard conditions. Uh, at the edge of a colony, you have a one or two millimeter ring in which that dynamics on almost, uh, it's not strictly monolayer, but uh, very, very thin layer. This dynamics sets in for on time scales which are 
uh, much faster here than the gr general growth uh, speed of a colony. And on lamp scales, which are shorter than this millimeter scale. So we have this, it's actually a very, very large system of which we observe here a portion uh, of space time. Okay. Um, here, all the cells are labeled fluorescently, and that's what you see here. And it's so dense that you cannot, it's hard to distinguish individual cells because it's so packed. Okay. Um, so, what happens is that it is so packed that they can, actually cannot swim. They rotate the flagella, activating the fluid, transferring force momentum into the fluid, but they cannot really swim because there are too many people around and they're blocked most of the time. So they don't swim, they agitate the fluid, they collectively agitate the fluid, and the fluid is set in motion, and this motion of the fluid advects and rotates the cells. And one way to see this uh, maybe more, more explicitly is, sorry, this is the same thing. Next slide, please. All right. Can you start? Here, only a fraction of the cells have been marked by fluorescence. And you can see that most of them are not moving along their axis. They're actually advected by the flow. You see this? Especially the long ones. This one, you see this? They're moving like this. Okay? Sometimes there is a little space in front of one cell and it can zoom in fast. But basically, this is a system of shakers, we would call them. They don't need to swim. Actually, they cannot swim by just uh, jamming uh, frustration, but they agitate the fluid, and this fluid feeds back uh, to, this, to move them and, and so on, giving rise to this uh, active pneumatic chaotic regime. So, all right. So what do we do with this? We can measure superimpose here. I'm not sure you see anything. We can measure locally on some coarse graining scale the orientation of this pneumatic order using standard techniques. I don't want to go into the details of this. On the similar images, we can also measure the velocity, hello, the velocity field by PIV, meaning pixel image velocimetry. So the way these pixels move is one way of, uh, on a coarse graining scale, again, of measuring the actual, the actual speed or velocity field of bacteria in the lab frame. Okay? So for, and that's the experimental data we have. For, we have movies like this, from which we extract the two fields, orientation, orientation field and velocity field. Okay? And now we can do, which can try to match uh, this data to, or can study things here, what we do in particular to to do the modeling or to help in the modeling later is to follow defects. You saw the defects in the, sorry, I forgot to mention them, in the orientational field movie here. You see the little red and blue things. These are the locations of the topological defects of the orientational field. So here is so-called plus defect, the little red things moving. And uh, blue triangular symbols are for the negative minus one half defects. These are represented here as a plus defect as this shape of a pneumatic orientation is like this here with a singularity here. And this is a minus one half defect with this typical triangular structure and the core here at the middle. So we can track these defects because this is just always a chaotic uh, regime. There is no way to stop or regularize this uh, efficiently uh, experimentally. We can use the defects follow them in their reference frame and average their properties to obtain fine, well-defined, precise, accurate measurements of the orientation, orientational field around them, uh, velocity field also around them, and so on. And these maps of velocity and orientation fields we use later to actually match a model uh, quantitatively. Okay. And first thing we do here uh, is we can, uh, given an experimental orientational field, field Q, or average, yeah, orientational, pneumatic orientational field, uh, this, uh, the fluid velocity field, V, 
should be a solution of the Stokes equation that you see here, forced by a force field, which is just this so-called active stress term, uh, which is represented here with arbitrary coefficients, mu, some viscosity, some friction coefficient, because it's, all this is on a agar substrate with pretty high friction, and some, some prefactor here. Okay? Uh, so we take an experimental Q field. We vary these three parameters, which you know, two of them are two independent ratios, this and this one and this one. Okay? We solve the Stokes equation, not too hard. We get the V field. And then we can compare this reconstructed V field to the experimentally measured velocity field. Okay? And we show that there, there are optimal parameters. These are the two combinations of parameters here. And you see there's a minimum of this quality function, which is represented here in colors. There's a minimum point here, giving you optimal values for uh, matching uh, for, this, for the solutions of the Stokes equation. For the solution, solution such that the solutions of the Stokes equation match uh, quantitatively the experimental velocity fields. And what you see here is uh, uh, an experimental velocity field at a given time, and the reconstructed one from the experimental Q field. In passing, we get good values or interesting values for these uh, parameters I mentioned. Here's a movie that shows you that this is true also a long time. Here, the parameters are fixed at the optimal values. You have the original velocity field in the experiment and the reconstructed velocity field reconstructed from the orientational field, okay? That's one step, but we want to do better, and we did better, but I have no time to go into many details. Now we introduce a Vicksteck style wet model. So for those of you who know uh, Vicksteck's models in continuous time, this, uh, this is the rotation of a little particle carrying a pneumatic angle with pneumatic alignment with neighbors and some rotational noise. That's a Vicksteck system, provided you move at a constant speed. But here, the particles are also rotated by the flow field V, okay, according to classic terms that I, cannot, I don't have time to explain with some uh, arbitrary coefficients in front of them. So that's the general dynamics of alignment at local scales, which we treat effectively, uh, noise, but also at rotation by the fluid flow. And of course, the particles are advected by the fluid flow as well, in addition to the self-proportion. Here we have a little repulsion term between particles, but that's actually not really important. And the F Stokes equation here again is here. We have a force field given by this expression, which is nothing but the active stress term that I talked about before, different notation, sorry for this. Okay, so we have estimated the, the, the parameters here at the Stokes level from the previous matching. And now we claim that we can find, and we did actually, all the parameters of this uh, microscopic part of the model from the experimental data using, in particular, uh, the defect properties. And I have no time to go into this, but it works. And uh, these models give uh, quantitative perfect matching to anything you can measure from the experimental system, in including the fine details of a defect and their dynamics. Uh, they are very, very efficient numerically so that we can also simulate easily uh, numbers of swimmers uh, which are realistic given the experiments we have. You can go to millions of swimmers very easily. So I have no time to go into, to sh convince you that we did this, but here uh, we have a truly quantitative uh, estimation of all model parameters and evidence that these model parameters are optimal in some sense to match the data. Then we vary the control parameters of the experiment, which is translated into variations in the control parameter of the parameters of a model, here all these parameters, and that for at least to us physicists tells us, brings us a lot of information about the experimental system, what is really important what are these terms doing? Is this, for example, this, this one, this term is not changed by any of the uh, experimental parameters. We should not surprise those who know fluid dynamics, but this one is, which is kind of a surprise, and, and, and et cetera. So we have lots of knowledge 
about the experimental system from this quantitative matching done at every single experiment we have. All right? This is uh, experiment number two, where we do active pneumatics and match it to a microscopic level at fully quantitative stage. Now, I, I, I'll go to the, maybe, yes. Third part, I'm not sure how much I've left. Well, One minute. That's not going to do it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, in the previous two examples, you could see every single bacterium almost and see how it participates to the collective dynamics. And now, and I'll just show you a, a movie of, of something where you don't see uh, what, or you don't understand how the bacteria can produce a collective behavior because it's, it's not readable from their trajectory. So, okay, if you grow E. coli cells in the lab, this is done in every biology lab, standard growth conditions, optimal growth conditions, and you let it grow to very, very dense swarming liquid, you observe something like this in, 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 uh, in simple phase contrast movies. Uh, this is, you know, 20 microns, and you have uh, maybe some correlations over 10 microns, 20 microns, and the, the cells are two microns long here. These are white type E. coli, nothing special. So over lamp scales of 10 cell bodies and short time scales, you have so-called bacterial turbulence or something like this. Nothing too exciting. This is very, very dense system in which the volume occupied with bodies of the bacteria is about 20 or 30 percent. Now, uh, if you put uh, little oil droplets sitting on the surface of this, here the computer is following them for you to help you. You see that these droplets describe very regular elliptical trajectories, and these trajectories are in phase. And they are in phase here over, you know, some tens of microns. But in fact, they are in phase over millimeters, thousands of microns, and even centimeters. So here you have hundreds of millions of cells producing this collective oscillation. And um, I skipped this. And if you try to follow now in an experiment in which only a fraction of cells are marked by fluorescence, to follow some of them, this is very hard to do because they're so dense, so this was done manually by some poor Chinese student. You can see that these traces, I mean, look, follow any of them. It's very hard to guess that these sort of trajectories produce this uh, collective red elliptical motion here, which is here given by some impurity floating on the surface. So here I have a system where individual bacteria do something like this. Okay, but collectively, their velocities, when you average them over large enough lamp scales, they, do, they produce this collective motion. So in the noise, strong erratic component of these trajectories, in fact, there is an underlying deterministic collective mode that you don't see at all, unless you know what to look for. Okay? And I will stop here, but basically what we can do is we can have a minimal simple model that shows here you can see, for example, uh, you can see nothing. That's the point of this movie. But if you follow individual guys marked in colors, different from the others, okay, you can see that you can see nothing, basically. And yet, collectively, these produce a circle here, not an ellipse, but anyway. So you can find very simple models in which at least uh, qualitative phenomenology uh, is, can emerge and makes it less mysterious, okay? Uh, of course, we have a better version of a model that produces an ellipse, but I will jump to this. Here you have, you have to take into account the fluid. Sorry, normally the two should go together. And you see that if you take into account the fluid, the elliptic uh, trajectories are recovered pretty much like in, in the experiments, in fact. All right, I stop here. There are a slide of conclusions here. And basically my conclusions are, you know, okay, you have new interesting or interesting physics provided by bacterial systems, um, most of this can be accounted for by simple physical local interactions. Well, not so local in case of a fluid, but anyway. Uh, of course, you can wonder about the biological significance of this. For example, well, this last mysterious synchronization occurs whatever the species, whatever, you know, almost everything, provided it's dense enough suspension, very dense. And, you know, it's done, it's happening as, 
it's just before biofilm. If you let the colony grow and grow and grow and then it dry into biofilm, before it goes into biofilm, you will have this uh, mysterious collective oscillations. And uh, we don't know the biological significance of this, but my viewpoint would be that there may well be one, you know, and, uh, because it's a very robust phenomenon that we have observed in many species that we can perturb and it resist and so on that is not linked to the history of a colony. It's really a physical thing that's happening with super, super dense bacterial suspensions. I stop here. Thanks.